Mike Parsley. I am the Assistant Chief of Outreach and Communications for the TWRA. I also am what they call the R3 coordinator, and my job in that role is really to teach people how to hunt and fish and shoot in the state of Tennessee. So um, I've kind of got uh, two, two roles with the agency. One of them is a lot more fun than the other. And uh, this is my friend, Jason Holland. Uh, Jason uh, is, is about as good of a fisherman as I've seen. And uh, I guess if we both had more time to do, we could be even better, but uh, we both have families, we have normal jobs, so that kind of detracts from from a lot of fishing time. But uh, when it comes to grass fishing and, and frog fishing and punching, uh, Jason is about as good as they come. I think it's more because he's hard-headed uh, than anything, but... Uh, My wife would agree with that wholeheartedly. You got to keep at this stuff and... Um, We'll teach you the proper ways to do it and the proper techniques. And uh, I know Jason knows how to do it, and I know how to do it. And we'll show you the rods and the uh, the different types of frogs, the way to tie up a punch rig, and then what you're looking for when you get on the water because uh, different maps provide opportunity to do different things when you're down there. So um, I guess... Uh, Jason, what I thought we would do is, uh, uh, one, start off and, and tell uh, Alicia what's going on with you and, and what you're trying to do for the TWRA. Yeah, so, uh, and again, of course, my name is Jason Holland. I am, uh, what I do with the TWRA is work with Mike, his team, and really focus, focus around fishing education. And so coming off of last year, a lot more individuals got outside, bought fishing license in the state, and really what the TWRA, uh, their vision, and I'm just part of that vision, is putting together series, putting together webinars, putting together podcasts, putting together videos, just a, a plethora of educational videos. Now, we understand there is a lot of places and a lot of avenues to go and digest fishing information. And we love every one of them. We, we are fishing nerds just like the rest, like everybody else. Uh, but from a state standpoint or agency standpoint, they want to make sure they're doing their part of trying to educate. And, and it's just a little bit of, of a different twist is that we're actually following the bite across the state. So from middle Tennessee, West Tennessee, uh, up toward East Tennessee and all the surrounding areas, really following the bite and being able to maximize catching fish certain times of the year on certain uh, Tennessee uh, waterways. And so that's really where it all comes from. And we've been doing it now, I guess, uh, well, since first of the year, had some really good success. Uh, we're getting into uh, you know, the backside of summer. And so we should, in our expectations, see these virtual seminars start picking up uh, vacations will be over, everybody kind of back in the normal flow. But we didn't want to take the summer off uh, because, in our opinion, at least my opinion, and I think Mike, uh, I could speak for him in this, we're coming into my favorite way to fish. Uh, I think Mike as well. And so we didn't want to take an opportunity to miss getting everybody at least a few more nuggets of information of how to fish the grass. We're very blessed uh, in our state to have hydrilla and milfoil and it's just a great bass habitat. And, and of course, we are right next to uh, one of the best bass lakes uh, with grass in the country being Gunnersville. So we're very blessed uh, in Middle Tennessee. Um, and Alicia, you've got Watts Bar that has got some grass coming up on it. Very, very nice. Uh, I have not fished it in a couple of years. I think maybe Mike has been over there um, last year maybe. But uh, we're starting to see that grass go through the entire state. And from a fisherman standpoint, uh, it's wonderful news. So just to kind of level set a little bit, we're going to kind of put some bookends on it just so we don't get too far off track. And really, when we're talking about fishing the grass, what we are referring to are the areas of the lake where the hydrilla and milfoil has grown off the bottom. It has grown up to the top of the water column. Then it is laid over and it's begin to grow on top of the column, which creates this canopy, this cover. Uh, think of a rainforest is a great way to think about it. Explain, explain the difference in what they look like. And then explain 
uh, the new grass that we saw kind of jumping into Nickajack that was down on Gunnersville. So we got the yeah. new grass up there too. Yeah, to make it real simple, um, you got hydrilla, which is going to be real long and stringy, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, milfoil is going to have more of a, I don't want to say bloom because that's not really a fair statement, but it's going to have more open foliage of that. And so uh, highly recommend, I, I didn't know the difference. I went on Google and uh, spent a lot of time just looking at it. I actually took some pictures of it on my phone, brought it back home one evening and really spent some time trying to understand the grass because like everything else, understanding what you're fishing is just as important of the technique of how you're fishing. Because anytime you can shrink the overall water column, uh, well, the overall massive body of water to specific areas, you just up your chances, you up your percentages of fishing in the right place where the fish are based on the cover. We do this all the time in other areas of fishing. We do that if we're fishing laydowns or humps or drops or backs of creeks or bed fish, all these different things. We do the same thing. So it's crazy not to think we wouldn't do the same when it comes to grass fishing because grass fishing can be overwhelming. When you get to a lake that's full of grass and you look at it for the first time, like I did, uh, I just shook my head. I said, I have nowhere to start. I have no idea where to start. I don't have a clue of where to even begin. But over time, putting the research in, attending things like this, watching things online, being able to understand it. So you got uh, hydrilla that grows up long and stringy. You got um, milf, sorry, you got uh, yeah, hydrilla long and stringy, milfoil is more of a foliage. And then, uh, I'm not really sure, Mike, to be quite honest with you, the, the technical name for it, um, but we call it kind of, uh, it looks gator grass or saw grass, or um, once you see it, and there's some guys on this call that, uh, that are good, actually fantastic grass fishermen that have seen it. Uh, the new grass. Yeah, the new grass. Uh, it's kind of a... Upside down Christmas tree. Yeah, that's exactly right. It looks like an upside down Christmas tree. And the, the problem with that grass, now you can catch them. You don't catch them as good in it, but you can catch them. But what happens, what makes grass fishing so good, our hydrilla milfoil, is because it comes out and it canopies. So you have this big open area underneath this matted up grass that's got, the bass can move in and out. Uh, they can ambush bait. It's cool. It's shaded. What happens with this gator grass is you have these leaves that go from the top of the water column all the way to the bottom. So you, you, it ruins the whole canopy effect. Uh, you can't catch them. It is, I don't know how it started or where it came from. It's obviously an invasive species that started in Gunnersville. And now um, Mike and I, for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago, saw it on Nick and Jack. So again, it, it's, it's much like the Asian carp is how I look at it. You, there's still big bass in Kentucky Lake. There's still big bass in Barkley. You just have to fit. You just have to learn how to fish it a little bit differently because of the carp this invasive grass is the same exact way. The fish didn't up and leave and go to the dam and go to a different lake. They're still there. You just have to be able to fish a little bit better. So, and, and while we're explaining different types of grass is this, fish relate to it at different points in the year in different ways. So right now, most, um, it's been a really good year for grass, but earlier, the earlier, uh, the better the, the milfoil is. So if you go to Nickajack right now and you try and catch uh, fish, you, you really have a choice between uh, hydrilla or the milfoil. And what we were finding on that certain day, last Wednesday, we were finding, uh, Jason and I, we were finding that a lot of the fish were coming out of the milfoil. And I found, especially on Nickajack early in the year in July, uh, and uh, mainly in July, that's where your fish will come. Now, when you get later into the fall and into the summer, um, the hydrilla starts picking up. And really, that's when your hydrilla starts capping out. And that's, I, I think it's the canopy effect, like Jason was talking about. That's the millful comes on quicker. The hydrilla lasts longer because it's more robust and it's more hardy and it holds the fish longer into the fall. So you really, really do need to know the difference between milfoil and hydrilla and know that milfoil normally is a better environment for the fish early 
you know, July and early August. And then when you get into late August, September, October, November, that's when your hydrilla really, really, really shines. So uh, know both of them and, and fish will come out of both um, and they'll eat frogs and they'll eat punch roots the same, but it's just going to be probably at different times. Mike, you want to share with everybody, I found it really interesting when you talk to the biologist about how fast the grass grows and really what it does. Uh, I was blown away. Yeah, um, we have some great fisheries people. And uh, one of them, his name is Jason Henniger. And uh, he he does a lot of uh, a lot of things with bass tournaments and things like that. He told me that the grass grows eight inches a day. So if uh, if if we get good water clarity, he said turbid water is what is what really hurts the grass. It's not current or anything like that. But if you get a spring with a lot of muddy water, that's what hurts your grass growth. He said, as long as we have a good, clear spring and clear summer, that grass will grow eight inches a day. So uh, it, it shocked me. I know that. So if you go down there one week and the, and the grass isn't quite there, the next week it might be. So don't get, don't get scared off. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, absolutely. I, I found that absolutely uh, incredible. And uh, the part of really depending on the spring and summer, uh, really dictates the grass because from my own ignorant perception, I thought it was all just water related fluctuation and too much rain. Um, and I'm sure that does play a part. If we get flooded, that's always going to play a part, but uh, really more importantly is just how, how the water quality really affects how the grass grows. And if you look at the weather patterns that we've had so far this year, it makes complete sense of why the grass right now is incredible. When I say incredible, I, I mean, we went, like I said, uh, I guess it's a couple of weeks now. And it's some of the best that I've seen on a good year when it's at its peak. And we haven't even got to the peak of it yet. So won't beat that dead horse anymore. But it's, a very, it's exciting for individuals uh, that like the grass fish. It should be a really good year. Um, and we should hopefully catch a lot and some big ones. And the grass, what you're looking for the time of year, you know, for the millful to start getting right for punching and frog fishing is I've the earliest I've been frog or punching is July 4th weekend. So I went down to Nickajack, uh, not last year cause the grass was off, uh, last year terribly, but the year before, uh, I was punching fish on July 4th weekend. So, uh, from July 4th on Nickajack all the way through, uh, mid-September and then they start really really ripping the grass out because of the current on Nickajack and by the end of September that grass is gone and you got to move over to Chickamauga or Pickwick or even Watts Bar so all this grass gets gets to be it gets to the mature stage right around uh, early July July 15th you can go pretty much anywhere on any of those lakes and punch fish if you keep your head down and uh, you're in the game. So uh, look for it then. Before that, the grass is still good, even early in the season uh, when you don't even see it and it's uh, you can catch them on red rattle traps, but that's another, uh, another Zoom for another day. But uh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, so uh, and you hit the nail on the head. It's uh, there's a lot of different ways to fish the grass. Uh, this is the most fun because it's the most visual, and it is uh, it is truly full contact bass fishing. And so that's what the attractant of it, especially a frog fishing, when they when they blow up and they'll blow a two or three foot hole in the grass coming to get it. So uh, we'll move through it. So this kind of that's the book in. That's what we're talking about when we talk about grass. You there's want a lot me of to, other grass. You want me to show. Uh, where we're looking for these frog or for the punch fish and then where we're looking for frog fish on the uh, Navionics maps. Jay. Absolutely. Uh, the more, the more visual, the better. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and then uh, we will uh, talk about it on here. Da, 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 da. Hold on, Jason. No, nah, no problem. Well, I might get that pulled up. 
the other piece to think about is uh, what is the difference between punching and flipping? Now we got a map. Okay. All right. So this is a picture of Lake Nicojet. And uh, a lot of people fish down here. Uh, and this would be the main body of the reservoir. Uh, and this is uh, Chickamauga up in here. But uh, this is all river. Right, Jason? Yes, sir. All right. And I'm not, I'm not letting out any secrets because most of the people uh, that we deal with know exactly what we do but uh, there are frog mats and then there are uh, punch rig mats punching mats and I would the easiest way to look at punching mats versus frog mats are really size uh, what can you fish a fi uh, fish efficiently uh, with certain types of lures so down here <clears throat> Around, hey, Mike, uh, Mike can you zoom in? Yeah, you zoom in just a hair. There we go. Down here, around, around uh, the main reservoir of Lake Nickajack. This is, uh, this is I twenty four, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's I twenty four. This is the bridge across the river, and Hills Bar is right in here, or right up here. I'm sorry. All of this is a map. It's floating hydrilla and milfoil. Uh, it has both in it. Those are probably, when they're good, about two football fields wide and uh, two football fields long. Up above um, Hell's Bar is the same thing, all the way along right through here. These are very wide mats. Sometimes they're, like I said, 200 yards wide, and they continue for miles. Uh, when you get a map that is that wide, it is incredibly difficult to fish it efficiently with a punch rig. And to me, uh, those fish are really not made to congregate anywhere uh, because they have 200 yards of grass that they can just swim through or whatever they want to do. Uh, sometimes I have caught them punching, uh, punching those lines, but it's really just out of sheer, just grit <laughs> and trying to get bit because uh, you're just hoping. To me, you're just hoping. Whereas uh, I have learned, and I think Jason's one of the people that taught me this, but, uh, what you're in your mind when you're punching, I treat it kind of like I do deer hunting in the rut. Uh, I try and find some place where it's going to be funneled down so much that there is just a small portion of grass that the fish have to be in. So if I'm punching, I'm looking for very short, uh, stretches of grass that have a couple of things current bait and they're not wide at all as, meaning they're between you and the bank there might be you know two boats uh two boat widths not one boat length or two boat widths 20 20 yards at most that's what i'm looking for and so if there are fish in the river and there is good current, they have to get off, especially Nickajack, they have to get off the river because they're not going to, to just sit out there and kill themselves fighting the current. And where is the only place they can go? That 20-foot section of grass. Jason, you want to take it away? Yeah, no, I think you, you hit some great points. And, and think of it uh, in reverse. So and what I mean by that is think if you go to – uh, we'll just use Dale Hollow. And you go to Dale Hollow and you've got a solid rock bank for 300 yards left and right. Along that stretch, you see one, one fallen tree. More than likely, there's going to be the fish on that stretch will congregate toward that fallen tree. Reason being is it, it, it's something different. It's unique compared to where they're around. But more importantly, it offers them some protection. The same exact thing happens with grass. And 
it's not the bank you're dealing with. You're just dealing with the sheer mass amount of grass that's in the lake. Like we said earlier, it's taking this overwhelming sight. And when you see it, and it's literally miles, mile after mile after mile of grass, uh, you can't fish at all. And so from there, it's about all right, how do I break that down and make that smaller, look for those unique things. Also, the other piece with that is when you're looking at, uh, you're looking at your mapping like we're doing right here. What's really important is once you get bit, say you're fishing and you're punching and you get bit, even to this day, and I had literally have hundreds of waypoints on Nickajack, and I'll, I'll give some secrets. Uh, what I will do on Nickajack, every day that I'm there, I will change my color or I will change my uh, specific icon, and I will mark every single fish if I'm in a tournament or I'm practicing for a tournament, fun fishing, maybe not. But if I'm getting prepared to fish a tournament, I will mark every single fish that I catch in practice as well as if I'm fishing a two day event, I will, uh, even a one day event, I will still mark them, even though I've got a hundreds of waypoints in those same areas. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to find out why are they there? What has caused this fish to this day, this time, whatever's going on this day, why that fish is in that spot. And if I can ever get, if I can ever get a two, if I can get three, that's really, that's, that's the key. If I can get three bites in the same type of, area or more importantly the same type of area on the mapping i will then be able to go and look at my map and eliminate massive amounts of water even though i may have caught them in the area i'm about to come up to really good if i know the pattern for that day i will completely skip over that area and i will go and try to find what i can that is that's what's holding those fish that specific day by changing your color or your icon of your waypoint it allows you to know what that is so uh, that is a, one of the greatest things that I've learned, um, me individually that helps me eliminate a lot of water and be more efficient. Yep. So, so what are you looking for on the map? And so it's, it's easy to find on Nickajack. It's a little more difficult on Chickamauga. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about both. Uh, but on Nickajack, this is the bottom end of Nickajack. Here's the dam. Uh, one, if you're going to fish the bottom end of Nickajack and you're looking for one thing that really always congregates fish uh, and in a narrow strip of grass, it's this right here. This is a submerged railroad bed. And the grass grows on that railroad bed every year. And it's I got about what six, seven, sometimes eight feet of water under it. And you're looking for grass. The deeper the grass, the better it is. It holds bigger fish, it holds more fish. And um, that railroad holds fish every year. And uh, it's probably eight feet wide at most. Uh, and then when you get down here, it gets a little bit wider. Um, matter of fact, there is a mat right here that's about the size of an Olympic swimming pool. And uh, I know for a fact a nine pound fish came out of, uh, right there on that mat. So uh, those, those mats, the railroad bridge and the one down here by the dam are uh, some of the best mats on that lake and uh, absolutely some of the deepest. Uh, those mats are absolutely the deepest. The problem is, you have to know what you're doing when you fish those mats. The fish can be on the inside of this grass line if you're punching, or they can be on the outside. And what they're doing is they're just pulling off of the main river and they're getting in the grass for uh, ambush prey or to get out of the current or what have you. But uh, inside or outside of that grass line, uh, the entirety of this mat will hold both punch fish and uh, frog fish. That that uh, nine pound fish was a punch fish off of that uh, mat right there. You have to know where you're going here and use good electronics because there are ways in and there are ways off of this big flat. And if you go the wrong way, you could really hurt your boat. So uh, that is a way in. Down here, there is a way in 
right in here. These, these right here. And not only are they ways into this flat, each of these uh, entrance and exits off of this flat are also delineated where the grass stops growing because it's deeper. And that's a lot of times where you're going to get your bites right on the end of points of grass. Jason, you want to explain that? Yeah. So when you're looking at it, uh, everybody just, it's no different is when you, if you're looking at Kentucky Lake in the summertime and you can go fish ledges, it's the same exact, it's the same principle. And that's the great thing about bass fishing. Once you kind of have a working knowledge of some of those things to look for, it doesn't matter if you're fishing grass or you're fishing 30 foot deep with a spoon. It doesn't matter. The, the fish are going to follow the same patterns. Uh, and there's a reason for that is because it's either to Mike's point, bait, cooler, all those different things. So when you look at a spot like this, if you're coming to a lake that you don't know much about, uh, this is a great way to spend the, where, where Mike is at on Avionics. It's a free uh, website. And these are where you, areas you can go and look at um, and look at it and be able to pinpoint exactly where you want to start. These are prime examples. And as you see, uh, y'all may know this, but I'll go ahead and say it anyway. If you look uh, right there, kind of in the middle, you have this, these dark lines that kind of snake around. All that is is a creek channel. And the darker the lines or the tighter the lines on the topographical map uh, mean there's more of a drop. And so what this is is an old creek that was there before they flooded it, and it's just got a deeper depression in the, the bottom of the lake because there's a creek there before they flooded it. And so right there on those points or on those corners are fantastic areas to turn around and the fish to sit and ambush the prey, especially if they're pulling current. Uh, they can sit there and it's a natural pinch point to Mike, what he said earlier, a lot like deer hunting, you're looking for those natural funnels or those natural pinch points. Fishing is the exact same way. While I've got the, while I got the mic from Mike, uh, another great place to look is just straight up uh, right here. Uh, Mike, if you can go to your right a little bit right there where the channel swings uh, directly into the bank. Right that area right there, uh, I'll give up another little secret, uh, is a great spot. Now, that spot doesn't last long just because, uh, as, as again, Mike said it earlier, as it gets late in the season for Nick and Jack, more water comes through because of the, you know, the fall rains. It starts pulling out grass. But right now, that is a fantastic location because, again, this channel, this deeper part is swinging right up next to the bank, and it creates that strip that Mike was talking about. Uh, that strip of grass and all those fish funnel right into that area. They sit there and as that current brings by bait, they say it sit there and ambush. That's another great way that you can use your map for map study, circle those areas, uh, having, taking the time what you're doing today and understanding uh, from people that fish it a lot. Hey, here's kind of how it plays out from a timing perspective is a great way that now, you know, Hey, for uh, several weeks or a month or so, I'm going to have a really good chance of catching on this lower end before they start pulling a bunch of current. And now you can, from there, be able to use that information and hopefully go catch some fish. Another great thing to look at, and Mike, if you can swing a little bit more to the right, uh, the top of that channel, you got this little, uh, uh, get the little hump. Mike, or just to the left of that. Uh, no, sir. Uh, down, uh, down near the red uh, marker buoy. Right, right there, uh, straight up. That little, right there. That is another great area indication. Guys, these are the same things that you look at when you're going ledge fishing at Kentucky Lake or even Nickajack uh, before the grass gets up. These are great areas when you're studying, trying to figure out where to go. This is a perfect area to go and spend, just spend some time, spend 10 or 15 minutes going up and down the area because as you saw, it had just a little bit of an indention. So the fish can get behind that current break in that grass. It gives them the grass and a current break so again, it's upping your chances or making more you making you more efficient to go and try the area. Now you can go and fish that whole grass line, absolutely, no problem. But if you get you're trying to be more efficient or you're trying to figure out exactly where they're at, looking for those on your map is a great place to start. So, you if I always when I look at maps, what I want to do is look at it. I want to pare it down into something that's understand. All a big river is, is in my mind, a little stream. And what I'm looking for is eddies, 
you know, on a little stream, a log into the stream will cause an eddy behind the log. Uh, on a big reservoir like this, you're talking about major points sticking out into the river that create eddies behind them. So that's the way I break down a reservoir. And to me, this, this sticking out into the river creates an eddy behind it, and that holds fish every year. A friend of ours uh, named Jeff and Ian fish that every year. Uh, and, About a seven and a half pounder off that spot on a buzzbait. Yeah, and this is a good eddy spot. Uh, a big point sticking out into the river. You can see it pushing the current even on the map. So that's, that's why that spot's so good. And that's what you're looking for when you're when you're looking for surefire places to punch or frog. You're looking for somewhere where the current has been affected and uh, either sped up or slowed down in some way. So that's what I look for. And truthfully, I think that's that's what Jason has always fished on Nickajack, and that's why he is so good on this river. Um, and, and where you find that the current is affected the most on Nickajack is, is based upon where the river swings into the channel or something else is affecting the current. And on Nickajack, many things affect the current, whether it's old ruins, Hell's Bar affects the current, uh, and it, it's crazy to see the river can be very, very calm. But you go right through here, the river almost looks like a rapid because the old dam is affecting the current. And so these fish stack up right here on the other side of Hills Bar, or they stack up right in here. Uh, like I said, that's not a great punch mat, but it is a good frog mat. So look for the current, um, and then you come on out and you can see where the channel swings. This is a good place for fish to be hiding, uh, where the channel swings up next to the bank right in here. This whole bend right here is always a good place for fish, especially that area right there. Not so much the inside turns. The inside turn to me, uh, if you're looking at it like a stream, is more of a slack water area. Right, and that's why the the inside turn is shallower because that's where the silt falls out. That's where the water allows the silt to fall out because it's slower. This is where the current is. This outside bend, and that's what you're looking for all the way down on this on this river. You're looking for the turns. What is going to speed up or slow down the current? Look at this bend. This entire corner. It's going to more than likely be better than this side where it starts coming right through here and the current leaving, that's going to be a good spot as well, okay, before it starts getting on the inside. Now, not to say the inside of this bend is, is not good because we've caught several fish on that inside, but this outside bend right here is about as good as Nick and Jack gets, especially for frog fishing. And I think one of our friends that's on here tonight, Gary, loves this for punching, but he punches like nobody else in the world. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, and Mike, that may be a, a good segue into talking a little bit about about the punch rigs. Um, mentioning Gary, uh, Gary is a fantastic uh, grass puncher. I, I, I've been with him a few times, and I learned every single time I'm with him, I learned something different. And when it comes to, to punching grass, uh, again, we're going to book in that just a little bit, really what that means. It's different. It's the same motion as a flip um, or, or a pitch. However, you like to, it, they're different, but a lot of times they get used intertwined. But it's a very small, uh, take your bait, an underhanded motion, and you're just kind of pendulum swinging that weight out there. And then you can dictate with your thumb how much line you let out, how quick you stop it, or how much line you allow it to pendulum out, and how deep you get in that mat. Where I'm going to go with when talking about Gary, I uh, I was very dialed in to roughly five foot into the mat less to the bank. 
excuse me, to, to my boat. So basically they got this strip and I'm fishing that five foot and that's really it. And I'm, I'm working strictly on the number of flips I can do or punches I can do in a day and working off numbers, which is still very crucial in the process because it literally can be uh, dozens and dozens of pitches, if not more before you get bit and before you dial it in. But once you get bit, you can really dial in that pattern. But where I'm going with that is, fishing with Gary for the first time, Gary would go and way past the area that I normally would stop. Uh, when I say back, we're talking 15, 20, maybe 30 feet back up in the mat where I've, I'm just completely, when I'm punching, completely left alone. So that I'm just, I'm going for strictly for speed, strictly for efficiency and fishing with him. Uh, one day I got absolutely smoked is the nicest way that I can put it on this call. I got destroyed. Uh, and Gary kept consistently catching fish after fish after fish. And that was kind of a, a light bulb moment for me that, hey, I've been, I've been so focused strictly on speed and trying to cover as much water as I can that I haven't taken the mentality of, hey, once I get bit in an area to fish, fish that whole stretch as far as I can go back to 20 to 30 feet in that entire area because I only had an option to catch them in this little square. Well, that spot could extend deeper into the mat that I was completely blowing by missing fish. So when you're in those areas and you do get bit, make sure you expand that area. Make sure you fish it well. If you go, if you're in some current and go past it, turn your boat around and go back up and come right back to it. Uh, once you fish the edge, another great tip, if you're getting bit in the back, just nose your boat directly into the mat. Let that mat kind of be your uh, anchor, so to speak, and then be able to pitch uh, and kind of fan fan pitch or fan punch around your area to try to pick up an extra fish or two. Explain, Jason, um, explain where you want your boat position normally punching uh, a grass mat and, and what you're doing with the trolling motor, how quickly you're picking up, putting in, and where you're placing the bait every time in relation to where your boat is. Well, boat positioning is extremely important. Uh, Joe Pudlow, who's on here, the one of the first times we went and took him and his father out, it was blowing, uh, I'm going to guess, 15 to 25. I mean, it was it was getting it. And that made it very, very hard. And boat position was extremely important. So I, I will talk about a normal scenario, and then we'll kind of back up and throw a couple of uh, instances that may change. So typically, what I like to do, and everybody has a different version. But in this scenario, if they're pulling some current, what I want to do is I want to put my boat, give or take, between that three foot to six foot, somewhere in that range. And really what will dictate how far I'm going to be off the mat is going to be how walled up that grass is. When I say walled up, is that there is a, a direct correlation of a, the grass that grows straight up and then it lays over, and there is a clear-cut definition. If there is, if it's I'm fishing a shallower spot and there's grass that kind of slowly tapers out, you may have to adjust. But on a walled up area, I'm going to be three to six foot out, and I might my furthest pitch is going to be roughly five foot in. Three to six foot from the wall, so you're, yes, you're almost on top of what you would determine to be the wall of grass. So you're three foot off that, and you're punching from the very edge of that grass to five feet in. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. So to think about what it visually looks like is if anybody in here has ever fished a bluff, when you parallel a bluff, all that means is you put your boat very close to the bluff and you're making casts right down the side. Uh, same basic concept. The fish don't care that you're there. This is not a clear water scenario where you got to get way far off the fish. I, it's just, again, they're, they're, they feel very protected in the grass mat. And so some of the things that you normally would do, you don't have to be as careful. That said, the more quiet you can be, the less I have to blow through big mats. Uh, I try to avoid trying to blow through a bunch of grass if I possibly can. Because, again, the one fish you will never catch is a fish that's spooked. You never will catch it. So I try to always be as quiet as I can, but it's not as crucial as in other scenarios. The other piece is that I find very important is if you can get – if they are pulling current, going with the current. Now – Fishing, the handbook of fishing, or kind of like the blackjack, the book, 
Um, everybody says, you know, you, you hit when you're holding this or you don't hit. But the book says in fishing, you should be going opposite of the current, going into the current, throwing your bait up and bringing it down naturally with the current. Most of the time, I completely agree with that. In this scenario, it, it doesn't matter because you got to think you're dropping straight down on this fish. It's not coming at an angle this way. It's not coming at an angle this way. It's going, you're going to pin them out and it's going to go up straight down. You're going to bounce it a couple times and pull it straight back out. I call it chili dipping. However, that's how uh, the tar that I see. That's all you're doing. You're just flitching it out, dropping it down. You are bobbing it a couple times and you're doing that over and over. So the direction of the current of the bait coming to the fish in this scenario has no effect. So if that's the case, to me, being more quiet, being more stealthy, outweighs anything that would come from if I'm coming against the current. So I want to get into the current flow, pull off the grass wall, and I want to touch my trolling motor as little as possible. Only thing I'm really doing with that is uh, is pushing that out. If I'm nosing into the grass or getting a little close, I want to be very uh, cautious about doing it because, again, I, I'm not I'm not on the trolling motor the whole time because you are, it's a, it's a slower presentation than burning a crankbait, uh, you know, down a rock bank. Slower, slower presentation, meaning uh, the presentation is you're just dropping it in. But once, once you get good at this, you will take one hand and punch your rig and you will make 10 casts in about 10 feet. And you're, you're literally number it's a numbers game how many times can you put that bait in front of fish and and at some point you're going to throw it in front of enough fish that they're going one or two or 10 or 20 are going to grab it and so um over the day you you make that many pitches you're going to get bit and uh that's that's just the name of the game and then like jason said when you find them slow down because I've seen it time and again just because there's miles of grass doesn't mean these fish act differently they don't they school up inside the grass so when you hit one uh, you're very very likely two pitches later to hit another one. two pitches later hit another one and I have I've seen it happen where uh, one of Jason and my friends Anthony uh, literally smacked three four pounders in the span of 15 yards at one after another after another so that's the way they are they school up and and uh you know that there's more down there the way they grab the bait if they just grab it and they take off you see your line just taking off that fish is not alone he's taking it and running off so the other fish don't grab it from him so Keep that in mind, like Jason said, when you when you find one, you've probably found many more, and you need to slow down and fish that area. So piggyback on that, uh, let's talk real quick about the bite. Uh, the bite, from what Mike said, will tell you a lot about what the fish are doing that specific day. And here's what I mean by that. How they bite it in the water, oh, excuse me, where they bite it in the water column will tell you at least for a longer period of that day, multiple hours, if not the whole day, where they are positioned in the water column. Here's what I mean by that. You take your bait and you punch in, and as soon as it drops through the mat, they instantly grab it. It tells you they are sitting up right underneath the mat. Typically, again, these are all uh, typicals. It, it can change every day. But a lot of the times when they're up there is if it, the water's cooler, the sun's out, they will get up underneath that grass right up underneath it because it's warmer. Uh, and so a lot of times as it gets cooler throughout the day, excuse me, throughout the season, a lot of times they will change position in the water column based on the warmth of the grass. And so if the sun's out and the water's cool, a lot of times you'll catch it as soon as you drop in. Second bite is if you pitch in, it goes all the way to the bottom. As soon as it hits the bottom, you feel that tick or you feel that you see that line jump or it just starts to slowly move off. Again, that tells you their position near the bottom. When that happens is usually you've got a real heavy current coming through the, 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 uh, the system, a lot more current. And so they're going to hold near the bottom. It gives them more opportunity to have current breaks in there instead of sitting up in the column. And to Mike's point earlier, fighting the current. So you got right underneath the grass, uh, excuse me, right underneath the mat, and then you got the bottom. The hardest one to deal with and figure out is when they're suspended in that, in that middle. It's tough. 
But once you figure that out, uh, you then be able to know, in essence, how long do you soak the bait? What I mean by soaking the bait is typically, to Mike's point, we're, make, we're making multiple pitches. We're boom, boom, boom. We're moving. We're efficient. When you pitch it in and you hit the bottom and you kind of yo-yo it a couple times, or in my case, I like to pop it um, and, and just try to activate the tails or whatever I'm, type of bait I'm fishing. I want to activate those uh, as much as I can. And they hit it on the bounce. Then that tells you, hey, they're suspended up in the water column for whatever reason. I don't really know why they get there. They just, they just get there. What that will tell you is from there moving forward throughout the day, I need to spend more time. If I'm usually pitching in, bouncing it a couple times, reeling back in and doing it over and over, what I will do is I will slow that down and I will bounce it three times, maybe even four times. And that's it's soaking the bait longer in the water because they're going to be somewhere in that, that water column and it's going to take a little bit more to activate the bite. Uh, so that's really a position within that overall water column from the top to the bottom and everything in between. Uh, and it's really important to get it dialed in that specific day. And then you can run that pattern for most of the day, unless there's a big weather change. First you get there, super hot, super sunny, and then a big storm front moves in. Uh, that can easily change their positioning. But fundamentally, where they're at earlier, you know, that day, they're going to stay in that position most of the day. Yeah. And um, so that's you're talking about the position of the fish in the mat. What does the bite feel like? Well, there, there are a couple of different bites. And uh, one of those I've already talked about, you pitch in the mat. And you say to yourself, you're looking, you got to be a line watcher when you're doing this. Uh, got to be a line watcher. Uh, not that the fish, if they, if you pick up and they feel you that they're going to drop it because these fish don't, uh, they hold on. You cannot, you can't help but catch these fish. They never let it go. But you pitch in the first bite that I'll talk about, you pitch in and the line just keeps going and you say to yourself well I know it's not 20 feet right here but your line is continuing to go what has happened is you've pitched in and before it hit the bottom like Jason's saying the fish has taken off with it more than likely to get it away from other fish and that fish is probably underneath your boat and and Jason talk about how hard you have to set the hook on these fish because of problems like that yeah, so you, you got to think, uh, and we'll get into rigs here. Uh, I'll make sure we, we save time. Um, we got roughly 37 minutes, so we'll make sure we get into rigs a little bit. But what you got to think about is uh, you're trying to drive typically a 4 aught or a 5 aught, which is a really big hook for freshwater fishing. You're trying to not only drive that deep into the fish's mouth, you're trying to typically, in that bite, you're trying to catch up with your reel because he's streaked out underneath your boat. And then you have to be have enough torque when you set the hook to drive him from all this grass and try to get his head out of the grass mat. And that is the key. If you got to get his head out of the mat, if not, if you go in with a light rod or a, a lighter power action rod, what will happen is you will set the hook, your rod will bend and you never drive the hook home and you don't get his head out. If you get him tied up and his head is not out, uh, very likely, uh, you will have a real hard time trying to get that fish out. You will make it harder than it has to be. So when you set the hook, um, you know, it's the old saying, I try to pull his tail through his mouth. Um, and that's, in my opinion, that's one of the great things about frog fishing, or excuse me, with punch fishing, is that you can swing as hard as you want to swing. Uh, if you get done after a good day of uh, punching and you don't have a sore spot right here on your side, uh, you probably didn't set the hook hard enough. And at the very beginning of the call, when we talked about full contact bass fishing. Ah, it's just, it, it's a lot of fun. Now, that said, I have fished with some guys that do not set it that hard. And their main thing is driving that hook home. And that's fine too. Um, everybody has their own style. Uh, personally, I want to hit the fish as hard as I can to try to get his head popped out of that mat. And then from there, I, I can work him and reel him in. So that's the first bite. The next bite, um, I would say, is it, the fish can be anywhere, but you get it punch through and the line doesn't keep going but you let it hit the bottom and you lift up and you either feel uh feel like you're pulling through a a, a blanket or you feel something down there munching on your bait uh, or you feel something just tug 
I mean, real hard. This is not normal fishing. The fish has not gone anywhere. You just got to set the hook. So, and you set the hook the same way, right, Jason? You just have at it. You do. And so, well, I think as you're getting into, into punch fishing, I think I'll speak about myself because I never can get in trouble when I talk about me. For me, I had a hard time making the transition in my head because typically I'm used to Texas rig fishing where I throw out a worm, I drag it, all of a sudden I feel a couple little pecks. I, you know, I reel out my slack and I feel if he's still there, if he's still there, then I'll swing and set the hook. When it comes to grass fishing, uh, as I say all the time, they don't have thumbs, y'all. Uh, if you feel something going on, he has it in his mouth. Uh, I don't wait. I don't stutter. Now, that said, Mike, Mike fish is a little bit different. Whatever you're comfortable with. For me, and again, I'm kind of a high-strung guy anyway. The moment I feel anything that sounds weird, um, I'll pull the trigger. And listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing and miss a lot. It is very difficult dangerous. fishing next to me. Yes, it's very dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> because the moment I feel something that doesn't feel normal, again, I'm going to set the hook. Everybody fishes a little bit differently. For me, if it feels different, I'm going to swing on them. Um, and I think over time, if you look at it from a number standpoint, I think you can catch a few more fish doing it that way. That said, that's for me. Mike may have a completely different opinion, and Mike catches it really good. But I like when I feel something, I swing on them. And I break, you know, graphs or I break windshields on my boat or I hit my partner or myself a lot. But um, that's how I like to do it. Um, all right. So if you don't mind, Jason, let's show the rig. We'll, we'll show the rig real fast, show the rod and show the reel and talk about uh, speed of the reel, get punch fishing done, and then we'll move on to uh, frog fishing. Okay, let me swing this around so I don't break something in my office. Uh, fishing rod-wise, um, we hit on it a little bit. Uh, personally, uh, I like catching fishing rods. The bill here in the United States, um, big fan of their rods. Uh, I am sponsored by them, so I'm going to tell you that up front. Uh, I do get a discount on the rod, so I don't want to. You think that I'm trying to sell you something that um, that's not true. I will go through some of the other baits and I'll tell you, hey, I use this and I pay full retail like everybody else. Uh, my personal rod I like to use, it literally says punch rod on the sticker. There is no guessing. Uh, this rod specifically is a seven foot 11. It is a heavy action rod, uh, excuse me. It's a heavy powered rod. Heavy power means this part right here. It's really thick, really stout. And that's what you want. You want something that's gonna be able, when you set the hook to be able to drive them out. What you don't want is a telephone pole, meaning you don't want a real thick rod that stays that thickness all the way down almost to the length of the end of the rod because you need some bend. It's called parabolic bend or it's called action. All that means is, is that you have some tip to your rod. So as that fish pulls or does whatever, you still have the rubber band effect of a fishing rod. That's what's most important about a fishing rod is that it does the work for you. Uh, so the action or the bend uh, this rod is a medium, uh, excuse me, a moderate fast. Some guys have a, a heavy powered rod with a fast tip, can whatever you like to use. Um, I like a longer rod, real, real beefy, real stout, and then I have a relatively fast tip. It's important. What, what that what that means is that tip that's pretty soft and allows the allows you to feel that bite tapers down very quickly into the beef of the rod. So you want something like Jason said, with a moderate fast action or a fast action with a heavy rod. So when you pick up any rod at the store, it'll say uh, heavy power, fast tip, or, you know, fast action or moderately fast action. And that's what you're looking for, whether it's a caching rod or uh, uh, a Dobbins rod or something like that. Doesn't matter. Uh, I like catching rods, uh, but you can go to any of uh, any major retailer, or even more importantly, which we always like to promote, the the local tackle shop here in Tennessee, uh, and they will be able to help you. You tell them what you're trying to do and looking for, and they'll be able to give you some really good suggestions. The main thing to remember, though, is you have to have a heavy rod. If you try and do this with with a just a fiberglass ugly stick or uh, a medium power fishing rod one you're going to break the rod in half and two you're going to lose the fish so you have to have it, it really does 
this type of fishing require a special rod? It does. It is definitely a specialty item for what you're doing. You don't have to go out and spend two, three hundred dollars. You can get some really nice price points in that hundred dollar range, seventy five to hundred dollar range. Um, and I highly recommend buy stay in budget, but buy the a better rod if you can afford it. It will pay in the long run. To Mike's point, you're not always fighting it. Spend an extra twenty bucks. If you have to wait a season to save the twenty bucks, then do it. You'll be much happier and you won't get discouraged. Moving on to the reel. Uh, as I said earlier, I am not sponsored by Lose. I am a Lose Real fan. I pay full retail like everybody else does. Uh, this is a Lose Super Duty Reel. All that means is everything's beefed up, bigger gears, bigger drag, bigger handle. It's just made for this type of fishing. Uh, I also use braided fishing line. Braided fishing line is extremely, extremely important. Now, you can go out with a heavier poundage fluorocarbon. You absolutely can do it. 25-pound fluorocarbon, you absolutely can do it. Uh, I know guys that still do it. But I think you were going to see a smirk over there, Mr. Parsley. Uh, I think long term, you're going to get better results by throwing braid because two things happen. One, it's a lot more manageable. It's a, it's a very limp product. It also, because it's a thinner dot amber, will actually cut through the grass. When you set the hook, you'll hear it snap, and it will literally cut the grass almost like a weed eater blade. Extremely important because, again, you're trying to get that fish out, and now you're cutting big, long strands, and that, that snap of your braided line will help, help drive the way to where you want to try to get out of it. And the other piece is you get a much, a much higher tensile strength with a thinner, a thinner line, meaning this line right here is uh, – I'm going to show you actually what I throw. Uh, I throw suffix 832, not super extensive. Uh, I really like it. it's a good line. Again, everything else you see on the fishing rod, y'all pay full price like everybody else. Uh, 832, but here's what's really cool. So this is 65 pound braid. If you look right at the bottom of it, it actually says it's 17 pound mono equivalent. So 60 pound, 65 pounds worth of strength in the size diameter of a 17 pound line. So extremely important. Uh, use braided fishing line. I like 65. Some guys do 50. Some guys do 80. 65 is really in my opinion, that's where you want to be. It's a sweet spot. And what's cool is you can use that same line for frogging as well as for punching. And so you can buy not, one big spool and do it for everything. It's not overkill at all. You have to use you have to use that braided fishing line, 65 pound. It's just it's just much easier. It lasts. Uh, I know I know people use it year after year, same line. Uh, you can get away with at least two years on that line. So you don't have to buy it more than once for a couple of years, and uh, it it's the way to go. You don't have to worry about breaking a fish off in the mat. So, all right, Justin, go, go for the uh, the rig and the snail. All right, so this is the actual rig, and I'm going to do my best to try to hold it up against my shirt so you guys can see it. Uh, but what we got here at the very beginning is, if you can see it, I will hold it against my head, this little black it's a bobber stopper. Nothing fancy. You can get them at anywhere. Um, I get these at Academy. I think I get 10 of them for like a dollar fifty. Some I don't know, super cheap. But you need a bobber stopper. And what bobber stopper does is it stops that weight from going up the line. So in a normal Texas rig, you will not have this bobber stopper, and that, that weight will travel all the way up the line and gives you separation. Punching, you don't want separation. You want everything tight, compact, because again, you're punching through really thick. I mean, you can have weeds or the mat can be multiple inches thick. And so you want everything tight and compressed to go through there. When your weight drops through, you want your bait coming right behind it because it allows you to get that reaction strike that we talked about earlier. So we won't go into that. Bobber stopper, the next thing, thing I use is a tungsten weight. Now, can you use lead? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know that you can find a ounce and a half or two ounce lead weight, but maybe you can. But okay, you don't need many of these weights. You're not going to lose many of them. Invest in tungsten. Tungsten is a more dense metal. It's much harder. Uh, it translates, it transmits the bite better, but even more importantly is it's a much smaller compact bait. Uh, and so again, you, you get a smaller package that's punching through the mat. Tungsten weight, um, this one actually happens to be an ounce and a quarter. And then I have some here in my box. When it gets really thick, um, this is a two and a quarter ounce weight, which sometimes when the current's ripping and grass is real thick, you're going to need that heavy of a weight. Now, 
it's all That's dependent cool. weight of of the, the you know the heaviness of the weight is dependent on how efficient you are in the grass if you are having to fight to get the lure down through the grass you got to go up and wait but you want to use as light as you can possibly use to get through efficiently correct now Here's another little trick that you can do. Uh, if y'all have watched any of my videos, I'm a big fan of red. Whatever. Like you see Mike's face. He doesn't necessarily buy into uh, the theory that I have when it comes to red, but I'm a big red fan. But these are actually uh, two one-ounce red weights. Kind of hard to see, but that's what they are. Now, one-ounce weight, if you can get away with it, great. Now, if you need to bump up, what you can do is you can take these weights and you can invert them. Now you got, this is the, the cone, the cone shape on top, and then you got another cone, cone shape facing down and you actually stack the weights like this. So now you have a two ounce presentation that's very small, very compact, and as it goes in, this cone will help split that grass so it can go through and then coming back out, it'll do the exact same thing. So you can stack your weights it's a great way to do it that if you don't have uh, you don't have the funds to turn around and buy a, a two you know couple two ounce weights because they're ten to twelve bucks a piece, go out and buy several one ounce weights and then you can stack them. You're welcome. It's totally free of charge. It's a great tip. All right, moving on. The next part of it is you can see right here uh, is I put a little bead. Now this is a tungsten bead, and if you it's hard, probably hard to see, but it actually will fit. It's magnetic, by the way which is really cool. Uh, what it does, you maybe see it on here. It will just slide to there. What I do with this, uh, this bead is two things. One, it protects my knot, All right? So I've got a ounce and a quarter, two ounce weight that's just gonna be banging against the top of this in and out, in and out, in and out of the mat. That bead sits there on the top and protects. So that, that weight is actually when it is sitting against this bead, not sitting on my fishing line. The other piece that it will do is it gives you uh, just another another advantage of sound. Uh, over time, as you're flipping this in and out, this bobber stopper may slide up an eighth of an inch. And so you get a little bit of separation. And what happens is this bead is banging against the bottom of this weight. So then now you picked up the another, another of their senses being the sound attracted piece of it. More, it's just a small added benefit. I'm not going to oversell it. The The big thing is, the knot protection that your bead gives you. Now, I've got black on here. My favorite, and you can't really see it, doggone it, is this little guy right here. It's a red bead. Gives the guy, gives, in my opinion, the fish something else to look at, to key on, says a red flash of the bait, and uh, helps him attract their eye and, and uh, allows them to turn around and track the bait a little bit better. Again, it's what I like to do. You don't have to do it. Uh, Mike doesn't believe in it, but hey, you know what? I do, so that's what I do. The other thing I want to talk about is the hook. Now, I think you got to be really careful with the hook selection that you do. This happens to be a five aught. You want to match the size of your hook to the size of the soft plastic lure that you're using. When I first started out, I was dumb, didn't know any better, and I put a five aught hook literally on every piece of soft plastic that I punched through the mat. I don't care how big it was. It could be two and a half inches and I got a five odd hook on it. Way overpowered the bait. Very low, it looked very much unnatural. I was just, I, don't know, I didn't know any better. But what you want to do is you want to match the hook to the size of your bait. So I use three sizes. I use a three aught, a four aught, and a five aught. Um, the four aught and five aught baits that are four inches and bigger. So what I mean by that is I will show you this bait right here. This is one of my favorite. This is the Berkeley Pit Boss. It is in the Power Bait product. Uh, it used to be in the Havoc series. Now it's in the Power Bait. But this is, as you can see here, uh, tells you it's a four inch bait. This one actually tells you the hook to use in it. It says super wide gap. Um, oh, before I get too far in it, you want a straight shank hook. Straight shank. We'll talk about that here in a second. So straight shank flipping hook. But anything four inches and above, I'm using a four aught, or if I can get away with it, a five aught, just depending on really the size of the bait. That's what I do there. Now, if I drop anything below a four inch, so uh, this happens to be the Baby D-Bomb by Missile Baits. Uh, I want to say this is a three and a quarter. 
uh, maybe three and a half inch bait. I am going to go with three yacht. Now, if you're punching grass, you think, man, three yacht's just not a very big hook. Doesn't necessarily matter. If you get your, your bait compact, that three yacht hook is going to drive into his face, and you're going to be able to drag. I don't care if it's a five pounder, ten pounder, you will drag it out. It will work. Uh, that's a really good one. Another bait that I like a lot is uh, the probably the most, maybe the first creature bait, I don't know, but pretty doggone close to it is the speed crawl by zoom it's a three and a half i believe it is it's a three and a half inch bait i'm doing a three out here uh color selection let's hit on that real quick i i like to keep it simple green pumpkin and some darker hue and then later on in the season i will get something with a brown or an orange uh just depending on but that's really it i, I mean you don't have to over complicate this thing by any means now you can dye the tail some chartreuse or so you can put some red on them you can go uh, all blue, black. I mean, there's a lot of different combinations and you do whatever makes you happy. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily a wrong color to throw. I, I haven't tried it. They probably hit pink or chartreuse or something crazy. Uh, again, they're, they got, the, a bass has the brain the size of your fingernail on your pinky. So let's not, let's not overcomplicate it. Let's not give them more, uh, you know, more props than really what they're worth. They're not overly bright. So let's not make it hard on ourselves. Keep it real simple. Try some of those baits. Works really well. Now, let's talk about hooks. Uh, there's Again, we talked about it. Uh, you want a straight shank flipping hook. This actually happens to be a um, hook I just got. I have not even used them yet. They just came out at ICAT, and they're available. It's a Gamagatsu, uh, and actually says super heavy cover. I'm pretty sure punching hydrilla and milfoil is super heavy cover. As you can see, it's got this really uh, pronounced bait keeper. As you're punching in and out, in and out, in and out. You want a bait keeper that's going to hold that soft plastic in place. Uh, it can be very important. I will give you another tip. Uh, I got turned on to this uh, by a professional fisherman last year. Works really well on your more slender baits. Not necessarily the uh, D-bomb or baby D-bomb. It's just because it's more oblong. But the Zoom Speed Crawl is a perfect bait to do it. Take, if you have a wacky O-ring tool, or if you owe rings, if you're wacky rigging, and we won't have time to go into that, but if you happen to use that wacky O-ring tool or an O-ring, take an O-ring and slide it down right below, excuse me, right above where that hook keeper will go. And so the hook keeper, on, or the bait keeper on your hook will actually sit under, uh, right underneath that O-ring. And so instead of pushing on the soft plastic and eventually over time ripping through, we've all had the head of our soft plastic just rip right through, that O-ring gets on there, holds tight, and as it pushes, it's pushing up against the O-ring and not on the soft plastic. Great trick, great tip. Uh, it will help you save, um, you know, especially some of these baits that are, I mean, they're, they're great baits, and they're, but they're expensive, and there's a reason why they're expensive. Uh, it helps you get some more, uh, some more life out of them. That tip was free. You're welcome. No extra charge for that tip. Let's, um, we've done the snail knot. It's on, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, I did it last year. I think Jason did it uh, yes, at some point as well. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Look up TWRA and uh, the snail knot, S-N-E-L-L, -L. Not, not like the animal, but S-N-E-L-L, -L, snail knot. Um, let's move on to frog fishing. Frog fishing. Hey, can I have one more thing real quick? Yeah, so I, 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 I'll make it short and sweet. We're running out of time. Guys, a great way to add some – some additional flair or a different look is uh it's called a punch skirt all it is is a silicone skirt that goes between your hook and your weight it gives the the texas ring soft plastic a jig appeal meaning that 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 skirt is going to flare and activate give it some more action check out a punch skirt they're really cheap this is actually by gambler but uh quite a few of them make them all right we're moving on we're moving on we're moving on we're moving on let's get the frog fishing we're running out of time all right Frog fishing. Frog I fishing, you're talking about the same type of reel, very, very fast, um, if you can. The faster, the better, because you want to mm -hmm. take up a lot of line in a hurry, and you're talking about a power rod. Uh, and, and truthfully, uh, the fast action still applies. You can you can use that. I, that's what I use to frog fish. Some people use absolutely a telephone pole to frogfish and that's fine too but i do think the fast action helps give the fish a little bit of tip it does 
Uh, so we'll talk about that real fast. I, I got to give one more shout out on the punch. And I'm, I know I'm way over time. Uh, guys, if you're not getting bit, the biggest tip I will leave you with today is downsize everything. Downsize, downsize, downsize. Took me a long time to figure it out. If I can leave you with one thing, if you're not getting bit punching after an hour or two, drop everything down. The size of your hook, the size of your bait, the size of your weight. And I promise you it will pay off. Oh, it, it yeah. Last last Wednesday, Jason was putting it on me. He had, I don't know, seven, eight fish. I had one bite. I downsized. Two minutes later, I had a fish in the boat. So it's hundred percent true. He he absolutely taught me something that day. An inch uh, from from the what is this four inch tip bomb mm-hmm. that he showed you to the three and a quarter inch um, baby D bomb, baby D bomb, or the Strike King Menace. That three quarters of an inch made all the difference. It made the, it made a difference in what weight I had to throw. I went from two ounces down to I think an ounce and a quarter. Ounce and a quarter, I think. Yeah. An ounce. And uh two minutes later I had I had a fish and then I think I caught another one maybe five minutes after that. So sure did. It was just all about throwing the wrong thing all day. Yeah. Downsize. Mr. Pudlow, who has been in the boat with me in years past, I'm with a hard headed and it was two, two and a half, two and two a quarter weight and four inch bait and we just pounded through them. I have learned the error of my ways. Uh, and actually, quite frankly, they all is because of the other gentleman on this call, Mr. Gary Robinette, uh, taught me a very bu- very valuable lesson because he did the same thing to me. So I had to get that out there and make sure you know. All right, let's talk frog fishing. Frog fishing is a lot of the same setup. It's a catch and rod. Actually, on here it says frog. Pretty simple. This actually is a 7.4. It is a heavy power, fast action, same reel, same line, uh, 8 3 to 1 gear ratio. It's a lot of the same. So... Um, it's very, very important that you get the right setup when you're doing that. So we'll talk real quick about a couple of different frogs. And when I say frog, what I'm referring to is a hollow bodied frog. Spro makes one, Strike King makes one. A lot of people make of them. Spro bronze eyed frog is by far the most popular that really started the hollow body frog. And a hollow body frog, uh, is, I'm going to use this crazy color so it shows up a little bit better, but, uh, this is what it looks like. A lot of you guys uh, and gals have seen frogs and know what they look like. They don't really necessarily look like a frog, but uh, they're, they're topwater frogs. And so you actually fish this on top of the mat. You throw it out, reel it fast, reel it slow, pop it, jerk it. You just, however you want to fish it, there's really no wrong or right way. Other than I think you can fish it too fast, but that's a conversation for another day. If you have to err and you don't really know how to fish it, err on the side of being slower. I promise you it will pay off. But it's a hollow body frog. It uh, has these silicone tails. It has, uh, I think this is a three-aught uh, double, the double hook. As you see, it comes off the back, and then it splits and goes on the other side. And this is extremely weedless because these hooks are actually in line with the body of this frog. All right, so uh, that's why you can fish across the map. What you want to do is from, well, let me go one more. Hold on. Here's another version. Same deal, Spro bronze eyed frog, but if we look, it has a cut mouth, much like a pop R. The old Rebel pop R P70 really made this popular, this cut out rounded mouth. And all it does is as you pop it, it pushes water out and sprays. And just again, causes more commotion and uh, gets the fish's attention. Extremely important. These are the two, the two main versions of a hollow body frog. The other last thing that I will show you is we don't throw a whole lot, but out west they throw them a lot. This is actually the same frog. It's just called the King Daddy, and this is give or take about five inches, and so it may not look like it on the screen, but it is, it's a massive, massive bait. It's going for big fish. It's, you know, I don't I think I've got 50 frogs, and I got three of the big ones, so it kind of gives you a perspective of ratios, but it's another version. So where to fish a frog? A frog is a great way when the bait has moved up into the mat and you are seeing uh, fish roll in the mat and they're in a hydrilla, the milfoil, when it gets real hot and it gets, it's called, we call it the cheese, but it looks like um, slimy yellow cheese and green cheese on top of the mat. 
that's actually an algae bloom. It's a great place to – you can punch it. Uh, Gary taught me that. But uh, more importantly, for me, I like to throw a frog there in that green cheese. Base coming across, causing a commotion. The bass see it, they track it, and then boom, they explode out of the mat. They grab it, and they turn, and they come back down. That's typically how the bite works. It's explosive. It will scare the bejesus out of you if you're not expecting it, especially when it's real early in the morning. And guys and gals, it is maybe the greatest bite in bass fishing, right behind maybe a good punch bite. But I think they're close. They're neck and neck. But it's an explosion. Bait, uh, go across, fish comes, grabs it, and then once you feel the weight of it, you set the hook. We won't go into real deep conversation about that, but uh, pretty straightforward. When the max rat is real thick, you want to use this frog that has the uh, more pointed nose. Uh, it's more of a keel shape, and it's going to, as you work it, it's going to actually pull that up a little bit, and so you're not digging in and fighting it the whole time. If you got some grass, you got some open water pockets, or the grass is thinner, this popping popping frog is a really great option for that. Again, causing some more commotion. Now, let's talk about a couple tweaks that you can make. We're actually just talking strictly about frogs fishing the grass mats. Same same areas that we're punching, we're just making bomb casts and we're working that frog across the top. But that's the only place that you can fish a frog. Really, frog fishing started by a guy by the name of Dean Rojas out in Lake Havasu, Arizona. They would take a hollow body frog. He actually designed this one, I don't know, 20, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And what he would do with this frog is he would skip it between the, the, cha between the avenues of these big bull rushes, or they call them tulies. Very, of course, very weedless. And so he could skip that bait up in there and he could walk it much like a, a Zara spook and putting a bait where normally you cannot put a bait. That is how the quote unquote frog fishing started. And then the guys at Gunnersville, Alabama really took it to the next level and started fishing on the match. That's really the quick version of the history with the hollow body frog. But you got more open water, make it very simple for you to understand more open water. When you need a commotion, use your popping frog. When it's thick matted up, use your more killed shaped frog. 65 pound braid, we talked about that. Extremely important. Because you got to think, you're making bomb casts 35, 40 yards. I mean, you're bombing it out there. And as you get a fit, I'm telling you, it never fails. Whenever you get fit, for whatever reason, by God, it's at the end of the cast. And you have to drag that sucker all the way back through the mat. Or you got to fire up your big motor or your trolling motor and blow through that mat and get the fish. So you need that 65-pound braid to go get them. Before we talk about tricks to, to either make your frog heavier, like BBs, or so, I guess you can talk about that, ain't you? Sure. All right. Um, before we get into that, let's talk about how to hold your rod because it matters. Uh, you don't hold it like you're fishing a uh, Texas rig worm or anything like that. You're uh, you're really just twitching the rod about six inches off of off of the mat, right? So, like if if you're five feet off the mat, your rod should be about twitching about six inches above the surface of the water and you're waiting for that explosion and once you see the explosion you don't jerk that's that's where everybody when they start off frog fishing that's where everybody goes wrong what you need to do is you see the blow up and you sit there and and in my head when I first started started doing it I did one of two things I watched my line and waited for the line to start swimming off. Because if you're far out there, you will not be able to see your frog and you don't know if the fish has it. So I, I watched the line and if he had it, you'd see your line swim off. They don't turn it loose. It's not like Texas rig worming. Um, or uh, what I did is I would see the blow up and then I would just count to two Mississippi in my head. One, two, and then let him have it. Uh, you just got to give them a second to get that. It's a big piece of plastic. You got to let them get it turned in their mouth and then hit them. You just can't jerk all, you know, right when they blow up on it. A lot of times when they come through the mat, you got again, you, you got to visually see that. When they come through the mat, th this is what their mouth looks like, right? So they're, they're very uh, aerodynamic. They come through the mat, and as soon as they get that part of their mouth, they don't, they don't come through the mat with their mouth like this, guys. 
because they'd be obviously just eating all that mat. They're not doing that. They're coming with the mouth closed. They come up through the mat. As soon as that mouth breaks that that mat, this is when they open up and they grab it. So what happens is as soon as they blow up, our tendency is to set the hook, and they haven't even really got the bait, their mat, their mouth around the bait yet. So you got to let them mouth closed, come up, open up, grab it, and then to Mike's point, I like I, I'm a two Mississippi guy. I count, and then I'll swing on them. The other thing you got to think about is a lot of times what they'll do is they never will open their mouth. They will come through that mat with their mouth closed, and they will hit that. Thinking of it like a bluegill sitting on the top just flapping around, they're going to hit it real hard to stun the fish. Then they'll come back in and eat it. So a lot of times they'll come through in that first blow up, and they're just mouth closed hitting that frog, and they'll knock it two, three feet up in the air. Legitimately, they will knock it that high. That, again, is where that one Mississippi, two Mississippi count will save you the opportunity because once they blow up on it, and if you set the hook, it means you got to reel it in real fast, make another bomb cast, hope to God you land in the right spot, and by then you got multiple seconds. That fish, that fish was ready to bite. The longer you wait, the less interested he's going to be. So if you can wait when he blows it up and not set the hook, let him knock it up, let it settle back down, slowly move it, he will typically come back and blow back up on it because he thinks he's done it and he's ready to eat it. Absolutely crucial. Don't set the hook too fast. And I promise you, your first half dozen, you will screw it up. Hands down. If you don't, I, I want to meet you and shake your hand because you're the only person I've ever met that has not got way too excited and set the hook too early. I still do it consistently. Another good point you just made, these fish will show you where they are. If you're, if you're reeling in and one eye blows up on it, you can reel back in and throw where he was, and that fish will, a lot of the times, eat that frog. So if you see one blow up, throw on them because they will uh, they'll come back up yeah. and, and eat it. Yeah, because that fish is not just up there making a bunch of commotion to be doing it. He expends as little amount of energy as he possibly can. If he's up there making a commotion and you see the map move, he's chasing something. So on his mind, he's ready to eat. And if you can get your bait on him fast enough, he'll go and eat it. Uh, two things, we've got three minutes left. Go back to what I said earlier. You can fish a frog in open water, cast it, and skip it up underneath uh, two leaves underneath overhanging limbs. Great product to add to that. If you're getting short striked is uh, Lake Fork Tackle makes a kind of a trailer hook. As you see these two, uh, I don't know what they'll call it, two little arms, it slides over the back of that hook. And it's that, that hook will just sit right here uh, and gives you a, a kind of a trailer hook for a frog. Absolutely don't use this if you're fishing the back. Yeah, you, will, you will do it one time and you will learn your lesson. Uh, that's strictly for more open water skipping at frog fishing. But I did want to mention it because frogs can be very, very versatile. The number one trick is this right here. These are stainless steel Daisy BBs. I got, I think, 466 million of them for 99 cents at Walmart. Um, they're, not, they're not expensive. Now, thinking, why in the world would you put BBs in a frog? So, real quick, you can see this right here where it comes out of the plastic. All you do is you put that BB right there, and you'll push it through the little hole, and you'll build up BBs. Now, there's two things. <clears throat> one, obviously, it gives you more weight. Actually, three things. Gives you more weight so you can get out even further. Gives you, uh, I, 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 well, you can't hear it. Anyway, this, this frog's got BBs in it. Gives you a rattle, right? So you got some BBs banging back and forth, so it gives you a sound. But more importantly is, if you can see right here, all these frogs have a weight put into the back of the frogs, molded right into the plastic, and they dye it the color. Um, there's another one, white. They dye it the color of the body, the bottom of the frog. What it does is when you have weight, extra weight in it, it causes this bait. Again, here's the mat. And this bait, instead of sitting like this, nah, so at least it actually sits like this. Puts more of his butt backside in the mat, which is a – it gives them two things. One, a, a, an item to key on. But more importantly, what happens is you're working this bait. You're, it's keeping your nose up, again, so you're not digging in. But more importantly is this extra weight is causing a – cutting a groove, right? You're cutting a groove in that grass mat because it's so heavy and you're pulling it through. Now, think about it from a fish's perspective. He's sitting underneath the grass mat, and he looks up, and it just looks like the top of a rainforest. All of a sudden, he has – he sees something out of the corner of his eye. It's a bait coming across that's just plowing a row directly through that grass mat. And what's happening is that, especially if the sun is shining, that's why grass fishing is so great when the sun's shining – the sun that comes through and hits the top of that grass mat, and what happens is it basically just shoots a ray 
that's been opened up where that frog has come through and caught a path. And so it attracts the fish much more when it's carving that path. You got sound and now they can see it and they can track it as it moves across the map because you've got basically the sun is just it's like the angel singing and saying, hey, here, here's what's going on. This thing is opened up. So uh, take some BBs. Uh, if you're looking for a number, I always start with six. It's my number. And then from there, uh, add to it. If you're a little scared, start with a couple and then work your way through it. We're out of time. We're one minute over. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Check me out on Jason Holland Fishing, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Thanks to Mike and the TWRA for allowing me to come and uh, hopefully share some tips and tricks with you. If you got questions, anything I can do, hit me up on social media. Um, as the kids say, DM me. I'm learning this from my 12-year-old. Uh, and happy to answer any kind of questions that you have. And uh, again, thank you very much. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Yep. Um, this truly is really the best bite of the year, both punching and frog fishing. Um, there is really nothing like it. So I, I hope everybody gets out there and, and uh, at least at least tries it. If you try it, I guarantee you'll be hooked, uh, especially that first frog fish that blows up through the mat. It's, it's like nothing else in this world. So change your life. Uh, Chickamauga, Pickwick. Watts Bar, Nickajack. Do not overlook Nickajack. It is an overlooked lake because a lot of people say Gunnersville's here and Chickamauga's here. I'm going to go to one of those two. Nickajack, I hate to tell everybody, is it's one. It's probably my favorite lake in all of Tennessee. So, it's um, a gem. At the uh, TWRA, we're putting on these these Zoom classes on hunting, fishing, shooting. And uh, we're doing that because we want people to learn how to do these things and enjoy Tennessee's outdoors. So get out there, buy your fishing license, go to uh, Go Outdoors Tennessee. You can learn uh, lots of these classes that are on our event calendar on Go Outdoors Tennessee. You can also get your fishing license there. Uh, if you have any questions about how to do any of this or any of the other Zoom classes that Jason and I have put on, uh, drop me a line or, or uh, email me. Everyone has my email. Uh, so thanks for joining us, um, especially some of our friends, Gary and, and Joe, uh, some of the better fishermen I know. So uh, thanks, guys. If y'all have questions, make sure and get, it, get in touch with me, and I'll help you in any way I can. Jason, thanks you uh, for being here. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you.